I'm in love, I'm in love. Anyway, <clears throat> have you seen that movie? It's now 18 years old. I know, don't you feel old? It seems like a new movie to me. That's when you know you're getting old. So I uh, posted online this morning, I said, help me out, describe the movie Elf poorly. <clears throat> So Jamie said, a grown man in tights that crams 11 cookies into a VCR, buys laundry for his father, and eats cotton balls. Everyone sings at the end. Not bad. Abandoned as a child and later rejected, Kristen says this, different Kristen. Uh, Abandoned as a child and later rejected from the only culture he's ever known, one man struggles to find his roots in a new city while navigating racial tension and xenophobia for the first time. She is way too smart for me. My roommate from college just described it very simply, man in tights. I described it this way, homeless man finds lost father, moves in and destroys his furniture and VCR. Susan says, I can't, I love this movie. Patty Ritter says, I've never seen it. Ooh, Don, you got some movie watching to do. It's okay, I've played It's a Wonderful Life in church and I've got people who told me I've never seen it. And I said, just the last 30 minutes. You don't have to watch the rest, just the last 30 minutes. Anyway, it's great to see you guys this morning. So today we're going to talk about the best Christmas ever. We're going to talk about joy. And um, the big question today is, how can I find joy this Christmas? And for those of you who don't know it, and I'll I'll tell you, you may or may not know this about me, I struggle with discouragement. And I think every pastor does. Did you know, uh, I think it's 35 or 40% of pastors this year have considered quitting the ministry altogether, not just their church, ministry. Uh, And so this year has been uh, hard on a lot of pastors. Uh, Of course, you know, we know all the silliness. Uh, Some pastors uh, don't want to do anything. Other pastors don't want to have church. Uh, Some people want to have church. Other people want to kill the pastor, you know. And and truthfully, I think because pastors are up front in a spiritual battle, we struggle with discouragement, and maybe you do too, but there's joy that you can have, and real joy. Now, I want to show you what fake joy looks like. It looks like this. There we go. This is the very first one. This is, somebody said, did you have the Atari 2600? I said, no, no, no. Before they ever called it 2600, I had this one. And you will notice the high quality buttons on here. You can choose color or black and white television, which is amazing because whoever owned this one has black and white selected. I will say I've used it on a black and white TV and a color TV, just so you know. So uh, I remember the Christmas that I got the Atari and I think it was Missile Command uh, or maybe it was Asteroids that it was my first video game addiction. If you've never had that or experiencing that. And some of the older people experienced that with Farmville. Oh, I had some look away, so it's true. Uh, So it just, you know, it's kind of like that. But, But so asteroids, and I remember I was playing and playing and getting better and better. And then I heard my dad coming down the stairs for to get ready for work in the morning. And I went, oh, no, I have played too long. And I loved it. And I played that for hours, for weeks. And then one day, it just stopped. Didn't really want to play anymore. Maybe if you got a new game, you'd play for a little while. And then after a while, it went up on the shelf and went in the closet. And then my brother gave it away with all the games. That's another story for another day. And uh, something that brings you joy immediately, like maybe, maybe when you're feeling down, you go shopping. Maybe when you feel down, you do something to lift your spirits. But the true thing is this, this, today, I want to talk about this. So often, especially this time of year, but all the time, we struggle with worry. I don't know if you've woken up in the middle of the night worrying. I I do just for fun. Guilt, shame, and we struggle with anxiety. And the opposite of all those things are joy. Those things keep us from joy. And... um, Today we're going to talk about three things that will help give us more joy. We're going to talk about faith, which will defend you from worry. We're going to talk about repentance, which helps you to deal with that guilt and that shame. And then testimony, which encourages us and helps you to refocus on what really matters. So we're going to talk about those three things today. I'm hoping that even if you're like me and you struggle with discouragement on whatever your hard day is, you know, the day after or that night, my prayer is that you'll still be able to find joy even through 
and anxiety. Number one, faith. Believe in what God says and he does. You ever think about your future and get worried? You ever think about your future or something you're dealing with or a conversation you have to have and get frustrated and concerned about something? It's hard to have joy when you haven't slept. How many of you have ever woken up in the middle of the night and had a hard time going back to sleep because you had a worry? Yeah, everybody, right? Right? And if you haven't, tell us what you take. I mean, tell us what you do, right? <laughs> the Jewish people would have known the promise of God. And today when we look at chapter 2, we're going to go to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at the shepherds. And um, the Jewish people would have heard Micah 5, 2, which says this, You Bethlehem, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And so they would have known that. They would have known to look forward to that. But just like us, everybody forgets to trust God when things are hard. See, shepherds during that time, there's really a, a funny debate because they don't know if these shepherds were Passover shepherds or if they were regular shepherds. But the truth is, Romans didn't want shepherds to raise sheep. You know what they wanted them to raise? Pigs. That was their favorite food, was pigs. There's more words, uh, uh, the Romans had more words for pigs and how to cook them than almost any other meat. So here's, let's pick up the story. There were shepherds, Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 12. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. So scholars love to say, well, it couldn't have been December. By the way, we don't know when Jesus' birth is. Did you know that? And the reason we celebrate Jesus' birth is because of Easter, not because of Jesus' birth. That's the whole point is to point forward. We don't know when it was, but the fact that they were in the fields doesn't mean it wasn't December. Have you noticed it's a little warm outside in December today? Anybody notice that? I mean, even in Ernest Saves Christmas, it was 80 degrees. I don't know if you saw that movie yet. That is a classic, more important than Elf. You should watch Ernest Saves Christmas. There are vital things in that movie that you need to learn for life. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, I don't understand, but every single time angels appear, they do not have a fade-in button, apparently. There's just people in darkness. There's no light. I mean, you might have a torch going, and you're peeking, looking for eyeballs in the woods, and you're hearing, oh, out in the woods, and you're kind of getting nervous, and then all of a sudden, boom, tough acting, ten acting. Right there, just right in your face, right? And... You aged yourself if you know that commercial. So, so it says, and they were terrified, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. By the way, that's where we get the word phobia, fear. Do you know anybody afraid of anything irrational? I know a guy who's a phenomenal hunter. He will chase a, a pig attacking him. But you get a spider near him and he will lose his mind. He'll run away from you. He'll, he'll run away from you like he is. What is wrong with you? But he would take a boar charging him down. And then you can go, spider. And he goes, wah, and runs out of the room. Do you have any irrational fears? They have irrational fear. By the way, every time in the Bible that, they have, that angels appear, except for one, this is what happens next. Every single time. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. Balaam is the only one that the angel didn't say, don't be afraid. You know why? Because the angel wanted him to be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy, listen to the next thing, to all the people. So not just for the Jewish people, for all the people. So even if these were the shepherds that were by the tower that were raising the sheep for the Passover, which we don't know, by the way. People love to make up something and say that they know for sure, but we don't know. And it's okay. Just like we don't know when Jesus was born. It's, it's okay. You don't know. And then he says, for all the people, not just for the Jewish people, for everybody. Today in the town of David, a Savior's been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, when you hear about Jesus lying in a manger, you know, one of the things I realize. Remember, Mary was told that God was with her. And then she has to travel because of taxes. How's that for awesome? She has to travel 60 miles on a donkey for taxes. Right? And so then she gets to town and none of the relatives of Joseph have room. You, you see how that works? Do you, do you have some relatives you don't get along with real well? 
It's amazing. None of them had roof. None of them had a stable. Do you really think none of them had a stable? So what happened? Remember, the innkeeper put him in the end, and then she's, she has the baby, and the only place she has to put him is a food dish. I mean, can you imagine at your house, I, I got to hold a brand new baby this, I'm a great uncle. I mean, I always knew I was a great uncle, but this is just emphasizing it. And I got to hold a baby, and it's, to me, it's like, this is, I feel like I'm holding China, and I'm careful, right? And so they hand me the baby, and I'm like, what do I do with this thing? Right? I can't imagine going over to their dog dish and going, let me just wrap it in some paper towels and put it in the dog dish. That is just crazy. If I was Mary, if I was Joseph, I would think, God is with me? Why did the angel tell Mary God was with her? Because hard times were coming. And difficulty was coming. Do you know why God tells you that he's with you? Because hard times are coming. If you don't believe me, listen to this verse from Peter, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. In all this you greatly rejoice, though for now you may have to suffer grief. That's intense sorrow. We've all experienced grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Basically, as you're going through the trial, you start to realize what your real motivation is. I tell people all the time, if you start to serve Jesus and you start to say, God, I want to serve you, you're going to serve him and you're going to come under attack. You're going to get discouraged. If you set up chairs one week for an event, you'll be setting up chairs and you'll look around. Nobody else will be helping. And this is what you'll start to say. I'm the only one around here who does this. I'm the only one who does. Hey, if you were doing it for Jesus, does it really matter if you're the only one doing it? You're helping with something. Maybe you're helping in the nursery and you give the baby back to a parent and they go, you put their diaper on backwards. And that's when you say, well, I meant to do that, right? And then you say, I'm never serving here again. Because you forget why you were doing what you were doing. Were you really doing what you were doing for God or were you doing it for you? The only way you find that out is when you go through the fire. You know how as a pastor you find out if you're doing it for you or, or God? When you get that letter. That says, Pastor, when you said this, of the five billion words you spoke this year, when you said this, you were wrong. And I usually say, yeah, you're right, probably was. Do you care more about the opinions of people or others? And you can imagine a couple with a new baby with all their family in the area being told, feeding troughs, the best thing you got. And then it continues. Though, though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious, there's our word for the day, joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Because when you really trust God, you know that he's with you, you know that he'll never leave you, and you know that this life is temporary. This tent is temporary. So when it starts to break down... <laughs> You realize this is not all there is. One glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away. You need a banjo to play that one right, right? We're on a journey. In Greek, that word for journey is the idea of passing through something. It's the idea of like going through the water. Faith defends us from worry. Did you hear me? So when you find yourself worrying, that's the moment you say, God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. God, I don't understand why this is happening, but I trust you. God, that situation that woke me up in the middle of the night. <gasps> I'm going to trust you to help me know how to deal with it. Billy Sunday said this, if you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. Love that. Billy Graham got saved because of Billy Sunday. I don't know if you heard that story. It's a great one. Number two, repent and obedience is doing God's will. You ever do something dumb you regret? Anybody? Anybody? Thank God this week I had to fix my air conditioner. And I called a guy because I'm not smart enough to actually read a manual or watch a video and, and understand it on YouTube. 
So I called a guy I know and he said, test this, check the power here. Oh, no, you use it, right? So I checked all the stuff he said. He said, then open this up and do this and tell me what to do. And then we got to a certain point and I said, I'm not doing that. We called the professional out and he said, what you all fear in Florida, the worst of the worst, you need a new air conditioned unit. And I looked at him and I said these words, thank God it's not August. Right? Right? See, it depends how you think of it. But let me tell you about doing something dumb. I've done tons of dumb things. And a lot of times we can get stuck because there's a difference. Listen to this. Guilt and shame are two different things. Guilt and what we consider guilt, I would even call conviction, is there's something you can do about it. For example, if I say something insulting to Brian, which happens about every other week, right? What can I do about that? I can go to Brian and go, Brian, when I said this, that was just, you know, I didn't mean to say it, or I, it was dumb when I said it, or gosh, the way it came out, whatever. And I say, I'm sorry, right? Conviction is specific. You can do something about it. Shame says, after I say something to Brian, shame says, Eric, you're an idiot. Eric, you never do anything right. Who do you think you are? Why do you think you're a good parent? Why do you think you're a good pastor? Why do you think you're a good fill in the blank? That's shame. Do you see the difference? God always gives you something specific to do. It's very different between guilt and shame. And the way to deal with guilt or conviction is to confess it. To make it right with whoever you've hurt, not everybody, but every, whoever you hurt, and to make it right with God. A lot of times, it's just between us and God, right? Because the thoughts we had were the things that were bad. So you don't go to somebody and go, gosh, I'm really sorry, David. I've been thinking horrible things about you lately, right? Because now I've hurt him, right? And that's the dumbest thing. That's even dumber. And by the way, I've done that before too, just so you know how dumb I am. I still feel bad about that one, but that's another story. Listen to what David said in Psalms 51. This is after he killed Bathsheba's husband. He had already gotten Bathsheba pregnant. He took one of the finest warriors he had and, and one of the guys who had the greatest integrity and had him killed. Put him on the front line, had everybody else withdraw. Death sentence. And David was feeling like he had gotten away with it until the prophet came to him and put his bony finger in his face and said, David, you're the man who took the one sheep. And then David wrote this psalm, and he says this, Clean me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. And then he said this, listen, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You may only need to hear this today. The only thing you may need to hear in this sermon are these words. God, would you restore my joy? You, you may not need any of the rest of this sermon. This, this may just be land yap, extra stuff for you. Maybe your only prayer that comes out of this sermon is, God, would you restore my joy? Lately, I'm just anxiety, frustration, aggravation, fear, guilt, shame. Luke 2 continues, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven on earth, peace to those whom his favor rest. So you can imagine the shepherds, and then more. Like one appears, it's like, wow, and then more. Oh, you can imagine their hair being blown back. It was like a rock concert, right? Strobe lights, I don't know what they had, you know. Do, 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 Trans-Siberian Orchestra stuff going on there. They're like, we heard this great stuff. We're going to play it when we come out. They said this. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. Can I tell you something about guilt and shame? Guilt and shame paralyzes you. And sometimes, not only do you need confession, you need somebody who can say to you, Let's go. Because I'm sure there was at least one shepherd still like this. And another shepherd, hey, <clears throat> hey let's go. Oh, oh. When you get caught up, especially in shame, when you've gone past guilt and you start to think, I'm worthless, I don't matter, what I do isn't important, sometimes you just need that word from somebody going, it's okay. We love you. 
We know, Eric, you can be an idiot, but we still love you. I, that's said to me almost every week at some point, right? And sometimes we need that. It's okay. So who in your life is saying, let's go? You know, one of the reasons we have small groups at our church and we encourage everybody to get into a small group is because you need somebody who says, let's go to Jesus. Not let's go to the bar. Not let's go to get rid of our troubles. Let's go to Christ. Repentance and obedience defends us from guilt and shame. And when you have somebody who helps you to walk through that, they'll say, let's go. Number three, our testimony, telling of God's goodness. See, they talk about social influencers now. Do you know they pay children now on TikTok to sponsor products? Did you know that? It's a huge industry. Why? Because so many kids are spending 80 and 90 minutes on TikTok and on YouTube. They're just watching these commercials. And I, I got a couple of the names of the people. One is Ashley and Emma. I don't know if you've heard of them. It's called We Are Cute. You have to Google it. Ryan's World's one on YouTube. These people are making millions of dollars. Their children are selling products. Companies are sending the products. They're selling them. So I know a lot of you are older. So you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I'm going to put this in your lap. You ready? Remember Magnum PI? Now he's telling you to get a reverse mortgage. Do you really think he has a reverse mortgage? No. Right? You with me? So, so people are, what are they doing? They're giving a testimony. They're telling you about something good. The shepherds did the same thing. And listen, when you give your testimony about what God has done, you can affect other people. Just like Magnum PI has talked people into doing reverse mortgages, you can bring people to Jesus from telling them about what God's done for you. By the way, if you have a reverse mortgage, don't feel guilty. I'm not trying to tell you that's not a bad thing. Just... So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. He was still in the feeding trough. Hold that baby, will you, Mary? Come on now. Anyway, all right. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed. This word for amazed literally is like, wow! It's the same word that was used when Jesus stilled the water, and the disciples went, who is this guy? They were blown away. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things they'd heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. You know what your testimony does? It refocuses you on what really matters. When you realize what God has done. When I get discouraged, I've got several, quite a few stories that I think of. But one of them I think of, I was in my 20s. And I had a girl come to youth group whose parents were atheists. They had never gone to church at all. She came with her boyfriend, who at that time I didn't like very much, just to be honest with you. And I thought, this poor child, who is this person? And I'll never forget, she came and started asking me questions about Christ. And she gave her life to Christ and got baptized, got saved, big time saved. She now teaches Sunday school. I'm watching her on Facebook. I love it. I see her teenagers growing up, and now they're growing up. You ready? Ready? In church. Mom's teaching piano lessons. Mom's teaching Sunday school. The kids are growing up hearing about Jesus all the time. Why? Because somebody, and I wasn't the only one, but I got to share a testimony of what God was doing in me and what God had done. And they heard that and said, I want that too. And when I get discouraged, I think about that family. I think about families in our church who've been baptized or came to Christ in so many ways or came back to church after years of being away. And I thank God, if you can do that, you can do it again. And I go from being discouraged and fearful and frustrated and worried and shame and guilt. Go away. I want to encourage you. If you're dealing with worry, guilt, shame, anxiety, take some time today. Take some time to say, hey, God, I want to walk in faith. I want to believe what you've said. God, I want to repent from these attitudes, from these actions in my life, from these sins in my life, God. I repent. I want to turn my mind towards you. And then finally, God, help me to share with other people a testimony of what you've done and what you're doing. Help me to even remember what you've done. And tell other people how good you are. When you do that, the joy will come back. I don't mean that life won't be sorrowful sometimes. It will. Some of you are going through grief, just like the scripture says. But even in grief, you can know you are never alone. 
And you know, even when you don't feel it, the Bible says he is with you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. If you're watching online, you can send me a note. What it means to surrender your life to him. Not just know about him, but say, God, I'm tired of living my life on my own. I surrender. I confess my sin to you. I want you to come into my heart. Be in charge of my life. I know you died on a cross and rose again, and I want to give you my life and live for you. If you're ready to do that today, I'd love to talk to you. If you're a Christian today and you struggle with worry, fear, anxiety, frustration, discouragement, my prayer is that you'll apply some of these principles from Scripture today that this Christmas season, just like the shepherds, you'd be overwhelmed with his joy, even in your struggle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these moments together. I thank you for your joy, which is unexplainable. I thank you for joy that doesn't always make sense in the middle of struggle and trial. Father, I pray that we could walk in joy. Lord, even as we go through valleys, that we would know the joy of your salvation, knowing that you will save us. So, Father, we trust you. Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. For that one who's condemning themselves, that they would know that just like you said to the woman, no one condemns you, neither do I. I pray, Father, that we would know you're not condemning us. But, Father, as we surrender to you, your presence would bring us your joy again. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. We thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.